Well, as we all know, it's been an unusually crazy political year. And many of you, many Americans are asking, isn't there a better way for us to select our presidents? Consider the endless number of caucuses and primaries that start earlier and earlier. The burgeoning number of debates during the primary system is, uh, as uh, Charlie told us last night, 20 to 21 uh, so far this season. Not to mention, can a candidate without major backing from, from really big money sources even run for president today? Is there any chance that states other than Iowa and New Hampshire will ever get to uh, go first and get all that national attention? How about Arkansas? Um, the central question, of course, is whether this process is winnowing not only the best candidates, but the best people to serve in the Oval Office. And then, of course, there's the Electoral College, which allows someone to be elected, as we all know, without having the largest share of the popular vote. And congressional elections deserve consideration as well. We now have a situation where only 10 to 15 percent of House seats are truly competitive, thanks to partisan approaches to redistricting and gerrymandering. In 2010, 87 percent of House incumbents got elected. With 44 open seats that year, only 16 flipped to the opposing party. Fortunately, we have some very knowledgeable people assembled to discuss and debate these and other areas of our process for uh, selecting our national leaders. And to lead our discussion <laughs> today, we are very glad to, uh, to have once again uh, Charlie Cook, who gave us such, a, such an astute and fascinating uh, rundown on the, uh, the election last night. So without further ado, I turn it over to you. Really going to get into here is what do voters want reformed about the about our political system. So that's the first rule: turn on microphone. Hang on a second. Sounds like you are on. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. I uh, uh, this I'm going to kind of step back a lot, but I I know we've all you know been listening to really the leading authorities on the leading authorities in the country on transparency in government. And, you know, if you were going to put together a summit, uh, the majority of the major players you've already heard from uh, this morning. And what an amazing, amazing, amazing thing. Now, while we've been thinking great th thoughts and contemplating all the great things that should happen or could have happened and the databases and the tens of thousands of hours of work that went into developing some of these things to kind of make government more transparent, you may be wondering what's happening politically in the outside world. And to me, the most important thing that's happened this morning was it's been reported that Vermont Governor Peter Shumlin was, apparently he caught four bears going into his bird feeder and went to chase them away, and they ended up chasing him away, coming within three feet of him. And where the governor's security was, I'm not sure. But at least, well, we know we still have 50 living governors right now. <laughs> but that almost didn't happen uh, early, earlier, earlier today. But uh, I'm really excited about this panel. I think it's going to be um, just a lot of fun. And what we're going to do is start off with, uh, with Celinda Lake, who is just one of the, the really the fine, one of the finest pollsters in the country and, and one of the most nicest, most well-adjusted people in the political <laughs> consulting world. And, and, <laughs> And I mean, I've got some of the people that aren't so much uh, coming through my mind really quickly, although there's a lot of wonderful people in the business, but some of them are a little eccentric. But, but Celinda is just a wonderful person and a terrific pollster, and she's going to start us off with sort of an overview based on the data. And, uh, you know, I try to stay away from data and just, you know, go with BS. But anyway, but, <laughs> but here's somebody that really has got the hard stuff, and then we'll move on with the, 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 the other terrific presenters. Okay. So, Selinda, you go first. Thank you. Well, Charlie is being way too modest. He is by far one of the most astute observers and also one of the nicest people. So I take that as a, as a real compliment, uh, particularly coming from him. 
And this is going to be a very quick tour of the landscape, a little bit of potpourri, really, uh, following lunch about reform uh, and all the different aspects of reform that my far more knowledgeable colleagues are going to talk about afterwards. Uh, you don't have to worry about taking notes. You can get all of these slides uh, afterwards. But what the heck do the voters want? Um, I wrote a book called What Do Women Really Want? And uh, which I, you know, I was going to send an autographed copy of to Romney. And um, <laughs> they, uh, I wrote it with a Republican pollster, too, New Gingrich's pollster, ironically. Um, but voters uh, want change, um, but they're not too particular about it. Um, and they don't really, they want to be sure that they don't pay anything more for change. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, there also, uh, there's a lot of things that are said that voters are upset about government. Actually, what uh, people are really, really upset about is politics. And so in many ways, um, the transparency that you talked about earlier, and I thought that was a phenomenal panel, and the kinds of things that Charlie was talking about really are what are on people's minds. But people want change in government and politics. Ironically, they voted for exactly the same thing in 2006, 2008, 2010, and they're going to vote for the same thing again in 2012. They distrust government, and you'll see lots of data showing you that distrust of government is at an all-time high. What it really is is that people believe that distrust of politics is at an all-time high, and that government has been completely captured by politics. And ironically, I'll show you some data about how people support additional government, uh, even federal government. We use the dreaded F word, federal government regulation. Uh, but the number one thing they want to regulate, government and politics. Uh, so that it's really politics that is uh, deteriorating. People also think that both government and politics have been captured by lobbyists and special interests. They oppose the Electoral College in really kind of high numbers, interestingly enough, even though the public really not very clear about what the Electoral College is, uh, but they also think that they ought to be able to decide. And more to the point, um, they don't like the idea that there's anyone coming between them and their politicians. They support campaign finance reform, uh, although they don't want to pay for it. And uh, part of the problem is, uh, you can get around that, and I'll show you some data, but people don't like politics. So why in the world would they want to put their own good money into political ads? Uh, they wouldn't, particularly when they're short of money, and particularly when there are lots of other priorities in their minds. But they desperately want to get campaign finance reform in place to get the spending limits down, to get the kind of money down, to get greater transparency around the money. And the public does not believe that politics is free speech. They believe that campaign advertising is paid speech. So why in the world is this protected? Uh, and it's paid speech where people have very unequal amounts uh, of ability to pay for it. And that seems absolutely anti-democratic to the public and maybe to many of us in this room as well. Voters also support voter identification laws. And this is uh, one of the more disheartening areas, uh, frankly, uh, for us. And the number of four voter identification laws have been going up. Um, you can browbeat voters into being temporarily against it, although they go right back to it as fast as they can, uh, by talking about really older senior citizens who don't have a driver's license or nuns who don't have a driver's license. But you know, there's only so many nuns we can use for so long. <laughs> and voters think, well, why can't we just fix IDs for the nuns? Why do we have to undermine our whole voting system? Um, people don't know very much about redistricting. Uh, but they dislike intensely the idea of politicians picking their voters instead of voters getting to pick their politicians. And if you see a common thread throughout this, it's get the special interests, get the lobbyists, uh, get the money out of the system and the power of the money out of the system. And in fact, one of the things we found is that people are actually less interested in transparency and really want accountability, not just transparency. And some of the kinds of measures that people talked about this morning really were trying to move in that direction. And one of my favorite quotes from a focus group was a guy who said, you know, transparency means you get to watch it go to hell. I'd actually like to do something <laughs> about it. Uh, so I like accountability. <laughs> so voters are kind of tired of watching it go to hell. And they think they've had kind of an armchair view of it. Uh, so everybody says everybody's anti-government. Uh, yes and no. Everybody's anti-politics. As you can see here, there are plenty of areas where people think that there are too few regulations, starting with special interests and lobbyists and government officials. Uh, and this is beating uh, even gas prices and oil companies uh, as uh, people that need to be regulated more. 
In terms of messages, uh, this is an, a, a set of messages around uh, making people more supportive of government regulation. But what's interesting is that top message, put people first, is actually a political reform message. And it's a message that would fit equally well Tea Partiers and Occupiers. And it says, Washington lobbyists have the time, money, and power to affect the decisions politicians make. Too many of our representatives have met behind closed doors with the special interests taken their money and done their bidding. It's time for our government to realize they need to make decisions that are in the best interest of the people, not the special interests. Regulation oversight of special interests and politicians can promote transparency, accountability, and openness to all, for all Americans. And this message was off the charts. 77% of the people found this message convincing. 55% of the people very convincing, even when we use the word regulation. We didn't say standards or protections or rules. We just said straight at you, uh, regulations. This message, more popular than every single politician who will get reelected this fall uh, or beat this fall. Uh, so people really mean it. They would really like to see reform. Uh, in terms of their political system. Although they think that the minute you do something, people get around it in a nanosecond. 77% of the public believe that there should be reform. 45% uh, say there should be complete overhaul or major reform. Now this is really interesting because the public's kind of cautious about changing our democracy. They don't want to amend the Constitution lightly. Uh, you tell people that the forefathers said this, it doesn't matter what you say. Uh, you know, there's a very interesting study that was done of the first 10 amendments to the US Constitution. Voters were against seven of the 10, but you tell them it's the Bill of Rights and people are all in favor of all of them, wildly in favor of all of them. Um, so people are hesitant about changing our original democracy. But even with that in mind, uh, people think that there needs to be change. Uh, anger is growing, but frustration is growing even greater. The number one emotion that people say uh, is that they are frustrated at the system right now. And there was a brief period in 2002 where people were basically content. That was like, have you seen that movie Anne Boleyn and, and King Henry? For one night, they both loved each other. Every other <laughs> night, one or the other hated each other. Well, that's kind of like the American public. So for one night in 2002, they were content about the system. But since then, it's been mostly frustration and anger. Uh, people do believe that government should play a bigger role here. They do believe that there is a role for government. And it's very, very important for us to understand that there is a distinction between political reform and being anti-government. People do think that government should be in partnership uh, on solving our problems because they are so big. But they believe over, and that feeling has actually increased. Uh, but their feeling overwhelmingly is that the special interest, the political process, will undermine anything that government does. So let's do a quick tour of the landscape. Uh, Brussels in 12 days. If it's Tuesday, it must be Brussels. Well, if it's Friday, it must be Electoral College. 61% uh, of the public um, would amend uh, the Constitution to a popular vote format, do away with the Electoral College. Uh, again, people really don't have very good ideas um, about um, what the Electoral College is. They just don't want to get have anyone get in between themselves and their vote. Um, and uh, there is quite a bit of feeling on the right, actually, to get rid of the Electoral College. Um, people identify that big corporations have too much power. 78% say that too much power is concentrated in the hands of a few large corporations. Um, this is test data from my home state, Montana, uh, but this is testing very well everywhere. Uh, an initiative that says that uh, corporations are not people. Uh, now, an initiative like this would actually fundamentally change not only political law, but also change consumer law. If you wanted to do one thing to change consumer law in this country, more on the side of consumers, you'd say that, con that you'd have a constitutional amendment that says corporations do not have the same rights as people. Uh, Montanans tried to do this. They tried to ban corporate money, wildly popular in the state. It just got thrown out. Uh, so they're really uh, upset about it. Uh, but 58% of the public, 45% strongly say that corporations do not have the same constitutional rights as people. They're not people. And we ought to be able to limit spending because that's not uh, free speech. In Michigan, 
a similar initiative that's not on the ballot now, but probably will be in 2014, 73% of the people said that there ought to be uh, requiring corporations and any person spending corporate funds to disclose instantly uh, to the state any expenditure that lobby that is for ads or lobbying. And by the way, a whole area that is massively under uh, dealt with in terms of the public. The public would like to disclose not just the money for candidates, but also the money spent on lobbying. And they're furious about how many lobbyists there are per member of Congress, how much more money the lobbyists can spend. Uh, frankly, right now, uh, the lobbyists are the best expenditure you can make. Uh, if you want to get a tax right. break, go buy a lobbyist, and then they can go get a politician. Uh, and that's why we have the tax code that we have. So uh, this kind of expenditure and lobbying, which is increasing quite dramatically, voters are onto that and are pretty darn angry about it. 71% of the public says the lobbyists have too much money. People would gladly outlaw political contributions from lobbyists. Unfortunately, that's unconstitutional. Uh, of course, they would gladly send all lobbyists offshore, too. So, um, And one of the most popular things that Obama has done is said he won't take money from lobbyists. Uh, people also believe that political action committees have too much power, 88%. There was a time when people didn't really know what these were. Uh, but now they know what political action committees are, and they think they have way, way, way too much power. And they also think this power of lobbyists and political action committees is starting to come down at the state level as well. Super PACs, people have no idea what a super PAC is, but they think it must be an extra big pack, and since they didn't like the little ones, they sure don't like the extra big ones. Um, and so they would just make them totally illegal. 69% of the public would make them totally illegal. And the biggest problem we have here is that the public has no idea why any of this would have any constitutional problems, uh, because they have a totally different view of what our forefathers must have meant and what free speech meant, and uh, that this is bought speech, paid for speech. This is nothing free about it. Uh, public financing of campaigns. Uh, people don't want to put their own money behind it, and they don't understand why under Buckley versus Vallejo, they have to put their own money in order to limit the expenditures. Uh, people would just limit the expenditures. But they also love this model of matching small contributions to their state with public money, and that public money or fair election fund coming from assessing a fee on big corporations receiving the largest government contracts. They, now, they really loved uh, taxing lobbyists, but that, of course, was thrown out, and the main law had that provision. So hitting the corporations who get government contracts seems to be just as good. And you can see here 63% to 23% on some ideas that are fairly complicated, uh, people support it. Uh, for many of us, uh, one of the more depressing laws is the voter ID. Uh, Two-thirds of Americans do support uh, voter ID, uh, including people that aren't supposed to support it. So one would think, right, that Latino voters would be opposed to photo IDs. No, not Latino voters, 78% in favor. You would think African Americans would get that this is voter suppression, but no, 69% support it. And this is our problem. People think, gosh, you can't get an ID now. Uh, I mean, all these workers have illegal Social Security IDs. My kid has an illegal drinking ID. What's the problem with getting an ID? How hard can that be? And when we tested, well, this will be very expensive. Like in Missouri, the estimates are it'll cost a million and a half dollars. People say, well, that's what's wrong with government. Those people are already there. The, the, D, the Department of Motor Vehicles is already there, and the poll watch is already there. What does it cost to get a voter ID? It doesn't cost anything. So I don't, you know, maybe government will make it cost a million and a half dollars, but it shouldn't cost a million and a half dollars. The other thing that's kind of interesting is that you've got almost two-thirds of the voters who think that there is uh, very common or occasionally uh, voter fraud. Not only a quarter say very common, but realistically, I think most experts would say, and I am not one and I don't play one on TV, uh, but most experts would say there's not a lot of voter fraud in this country, um, or certainly not that would be captured by IDs. Um, but uh, voters think that there is voter fraud and voter theft. In focus groups, um, people also talked about the fact, uh, why can't people just go get IDs? How hard is that? Um, when you talk to people about um, that it'll uh, eliminate voting and the numbers of people that could be disqualified, then people start to step back a little bit. Uh, but they're really skeptical that that many people could be disqualified. And unfortunately, they want to fix the ID problem not the voter suppression problem. So if there are people who don't get have IDs, let's go get them IDs. 
uh, let's not, but let's still require them at the voting booth. And finally, redistricting. Well, first of all, voters have no idea what redistricting is, and they're not really clear that it gets changed every 10 years, and they're not really clear why it is uh, that it gets changed every year, and they tend, in the first election after redistricting, to want to hold on to their old congressperson, and many candidates will tell you that people are asked, well, why are you running against Joe? And it's like, you don't have Joe to vote for anymore. I'm not running against Joe. Um, Redistricting initiatives, though, are fairly popular, uh, and even though they're fairly complex. When you talk about independent, nonpartisan citizen commissions, that it won't favor any party, 54% of the public favors it, but they really don't have the ability to judge between good redistricting proposals and bad redistricting proposals. They do, however, respond to rhetoric that taps into some of these broader sentiments. And when you say that districts cannot be drawn to favor or disfavor any incumbent or political party, then a whopping 70% of the voters like this. Uh, and so when you tap into the anti-politician sentiment, uh, it's very strong. And there are three arguments that work around redistricting. The first argument that works is we shouldn't put the foxes in charge of the hen house, a good tried and true Arkansan type metaphor. And uh, voters think it is ridiculous that you would put politicians in charge of their own districts. Then when you take that one step further and say politicians are going to get to choose their voters rather than you, the voter, getting to choose the politician, voters are really upset by that because they think the day after being sworn in, most politicians start running for a re-election and start worrying about how they're getting re-elected rather than doing the kind of job that they should be doing. And then when you also tell them that it will lead to more uh, competition and less partisanship, uh, people also very strongly in favor of uh, redistricting reform. So there are lots of ways in which you can tap uh, reform sentiments out there. Reforms are very, very strong. No one would, in their right mind would run against reform, but it's also pretty easy to undermine reform because the devil's in the details and the voters can't sort out the details. The overwhelming thread that works from everywhere from an occupier to a tea partier is that lobbyists and special interests have too much influence they are buying politicians, and that politicians are in a self-serving relationship with the lobbyists and special interests. And that's the golden triangle that voters would like to break, and that's the criteria that they bring to almost every aspect of reform. So let me turn it over to Todd to talk about some of this in more detail. Actually, let me introduce you. Yeah. You know, listening to Celinda's great presentation, it reminded me of a saying of, uh, Earl Long from my home state of Louisiana. Vote for my opponent and you'll get good government. Vote for, my, vote for me and you'll get pretty good government. And uh, anyway, different, different, different look on things in Louisiana. Our next presenter is, is Todd Shields. Todd's a, one of the deans up at the University of Arkansas, but far more importantly to me, is the director of the Diane Blair Center on Southern Politics and Society at the university and author of uh, numerous books and articles. And, and I, loved, I loved one of them, uh, The Persuadable Voter Wedge Issues in Presidential Campaigns. And Lord knows you didn't have, uh, you didn't have any problems finding uh, examples of the use of that, but uh, explaining it very, very well. But um, Todd, why don't you go next? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Oh, come on, fight that food coma, come on. Wow, let's go, can you hear me okay? You know, I teach 18 year olds, so if you're quiet, I don't know what's going on out there, okay? So let's try that again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, much better. Uh, I, um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different tact here, and I first came to the mountain, I don't know, several years ago, and when I first came into the, I guess, the atrium out there, I saw the, the words that were up there, and just want to read it again and look when you go out. Every citizen has the duty to be informed, to be thoughtfully concerned, and to participate in the search for solutions. Now, I have to tell you, as soon as I walked in there, I was like, wait a minute, this is, this is my whole field. Governor Rockefeller was de de describing political behavior way before political behavior started. And you can ask the political scientists in here, this is what economists and, and psychologists and sociologists are trying to figure out. I am going to go quickly here. There are several people that have to make a plane on our, on our panel, and Jessica is going to start throwing things at me in about 10 minutes. So I want to go backwards here. I want to talk about participating, and I'm going to give you the story ahead of time. 
Uh, on a participation scale, I'm going to give us as a public, I'm going to give us a B plus. It could be better, but we're not doing that bad, and there are signs that we're going to be improving. Uh, concerned. Celinda talked about the distrust, but interestingly enough, I'm going to show you, people are still concerned. They distrust the politicians, congressional approvals at an all-time low, but they're still concerned. They're still interested. They, they haven't completely checked out yet. Where, I'm going to give us about an A minus to a B on that one. Where I'm going to give us a D, or maybe even an F, is in that last one, informed. And this is where something that I would like to say is a political reform that we need to talk about more, and I think falls right in the legacy of Governor Rockefeller. I think it was David Pryor yesterday that was talking about that he brought teachers to the mountain to teach people how to read. Um, the education that we're doing, and I'm speaking as an educator, I see this as a real problem, then I feel like I'm fighting the tide, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start here. Okay, voter turnout in presidential elections. You know, when I first started graduate school and studying politics in the 1980s and then early 1990s, there was this outcry among political scientists and pundits that, oh, the voters are going away and vanishing voters and where are we going? And it turned out to not, not be true, that we're actually participating at the same levels that we were in the 50s and the 60s. And in the last couple of elections, if you look at 2000, 2004, and 2008, we're, we're moving back up. We're moving in the right direction. Now, you can say, hey, wait a minute, shouldn't we have a whole lot more people participating? And I would say absolutely yes. We should have a whole lot more participating. But given it's not mandatory, given that we don't have a day off to do this, there's no real incentive to do this, I'm happy to see it going up. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that I'm really happy about everything. I want to move to the next slide. Now, you give a professor a microphone and I'm going to give you a book to read. I'm just sorry. You just have to play along with me. But in my field, these are some of the books that have really redefined things and made us think about things differently. Um, a New Engagement, this book right here. Uh, one of the things that they're pointing out is that there are big cohort differences between older uh, Americans and younger Americans. And whereas we're seeing similar types of political information, we're seeing the younger people wanting to get involved locally, and we're seeing them want to use their pocketbook more than older people. So they're not as interested in turning out and voting, which they're seeing as not as impactful as using my pocketbook and supporting one company and opposing another. Now that's a really interesting type of political engagement that this country really hasn't seen a whole lot of, but it's something that we're keeping an eye on because we're seeing that that's happening more and more. Another thing that is in impacting where we're going uh, in terms of participation in this country, voice inequality came out several years ago and it is earth-breaking in terms of, earth-shattering in terms of how do people get involved? Now, what's really important here is they find big differences between types of churches. Now, I'm giving you a Sesame Street version of this book here. But Baptist churches involve people in politics almost immediately. Almost immediately, you're, you're asked to join a Bible study. You're asked to join a group. You're asked to write a letter. You're asked to start participating in church governance. Whereas in Catholic churches and other denominations, it's very hierarchical. And you can sit in the pew and then leave and not be ever asked to do anything. I'm being very uh, Mr. Rogers Sesame Street here. But this is the gist of their argument. That has big implications for the participation of this country in the future as our demographics are changing and as our church attendances are changing. Because churches have been and continue to be one of the main focuses of getting people mobilized into politics. Okay, let me change next to interest in current campaign. I remember what Celinda was talking about the distrust. Distrust is huge. Distrust has not yet, however, turned into I'm not interested. They, the national election study since 1952 has asked every two years, I'm showing presidential elections here, how interested are you in the current campaign? You know, we're still way above the 80%. You know, so people are still very much interested. There's a whole battery of questions about this. Do they, are they, you concerned about it? Do you follow it? How often do you follow it? Do you talk to your neighbors about it? Um, do you talk to your coworkers about it? And all of that is up. So the, the distrust has not made people yet at least just completely tune out. They're still interested. I think that's good news. All right, here's where we're getting to the bad news. And then in a second, I'm going to ask you some other questions too. But 
The NES has also asked people which party had the most members of Congress before the elections. Now, now they asked these questions the day of the election, right after the election, and about two weeks after that. So it's right at the election. Um, and I'm going to give you some others here in a second, too. But some fundamental things. I think someone said in an earlier panel today, how do we keep government officials accountable? How do we even participate in government if we don't even know what's going on? And for an educator, this is the type of thing that really keeps me up at night. When I have freshmen, I have 100, 200 in a room, and I'm asking them very simple things about politics, and they haven't been taught. They just don't know. I mean, they're really smart kids, but it's not something that they're getting. So let's, let's look at this. And since this is the line for correct answer, and since about 92, it's going down, 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 down. They're, they're, people are voting for presidents and their, their representatives, and they don't have a clue who is even in office right now. Now, if it stopped there, that'd be one thing. But I want to give a, a, a selfish plug here. Um, we have data at the, with our partnership, with the Blair Center's partnership with the Rockefeller Institute. We have data that, that makes survey researchers and pollsters drool. Um, we have representative samples of all of these different populations here because we really wanted to understand how the South is significantly different, how it's not different from the, from the non-South, and all these new voices in the South with more African Americans moving back to the South, more Latinos immigrating into the South. We, we have a brand new South and we want to understand it. And so we actually have 3,400 respondents and representative samples of all of these different groups. And we ask them questions about knowledge. Now, one of the things that we're able to do with using Knowledge Networks, which is a company that we used, they do all their uh, surveying online. So we can show people pictures. Now, a lot of times when people do polls, has anybody ever done a poll where they've called and they've asked and they say, hey, by the way, do you know who the vice president is? Has anybody had that happen to them? Somehow I'm on the list. I don't know. I get called all the time. Okay. Um, you know, we, we had the idea, well, you know, that's a little difficult, you know, if, if you just say, who is it? Or if you go to the Speaker of the House, or you go, who's the Supreme Court Chief Justice? Maybe people are busy, and I know how survey research is done, and, you know, mom's got three kids pulling at her, and they've got to get to work, and somebody else is not there, and it's busy, and you're thinking, I can't remember right now. Well, we wanted to show pictures. Well, showing pictures showed us that people do know a little bit more, but unfortunately it didn't really give us a lot to scream and yell about, to be excited about. I mean, Joe Biden, 75% in the South, 73% in the non-South. I love to break it down when the South does a little bit better than the non-South, whether even though it's probably within the margin of error still. <laughs> Eric Holder, look at this, 27%. John, Chief Justice John Roberts, 25%. The number of people that knew that he was leaning conservative was 17%. Now, I didn't have great pictures for this, so I didn't uh, put a slide for this. But the percentage of people, now remember, we're talking about a lot, a really representative sample of the United States. It's the percent who knew we have a trade deficit in this country, 60%. The percent that knew who the president of Russia is, 36%. The percent that knew who Harry Reid is, you want to take a guess? 15. 15%. Now, you might say, well, hey, compared to what? You know, maybe those numbers are fantastic. Well, let me tell you, compared to what? 90% of the respondents uh, correctly identified Britney Spears. 90%. Now, we break that I'm down in 10%. every group. <laughs> now, the other 10%, we're not sure, right? Peyton Manning. You want to take a guess? Anybody saying, who's Peyton Manning? <laughs> it's 80%. So 80%. He's almost up there with Brittany, but not quite. But he's way ahead of Joe Biden. Okay, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Take a guess. Oh, in some groups, 100%, 96% identify Nar uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. About, about two months ago, the Pew Center released a study where they, they conducted a civics test online. Uh, and basically, it was things that they, there were a couple questions that I might quibble with, but for the most part, they wanted to see if the, if the American public would pass a civics test. Now, if you're interested in it, go there and take it, you know, see, see how you do. Um, the difficult thing for me was that only 6% of Americans would have gotten an A on it. 
I mean, they got a 90 or percent of it. Over 50 percent of Americans failed it. Now, how is this happening when we are also having all these news outlets, right? And we have all this new, we were bombarded with information, right? You know, one of the things that we're finding is that conservatives are definitely going to conservative radio and they're definitely going to conservative television. Liberals are going to liberal television and I should say liberal websites now too, right? And I don't know if you can follow liberals and follow conservatives. I don't tweet, so I don't really know that. But um, I think you could probably limit what you're getting there as well. What we're finding is that you know, television and media don't really tell you what to think, but they definitely tell you what to think about. So if you're following conservative news, you're thinking about those things that conservative news is telling you. You're not thinking about the things that the liberal media is telling you. If you're following the liberal media news, you're thinking about the things that they're telling you. So from an information standpoint, we come back and we can test people. We can find the people that are really following Fox News are a little bit more informed on the things that they're talking about. They're completely ignorant about what's happening in the meat left news. The people following the left are a little bit more knowledgeable about what they're talking about, but completely ignorant about what's going on over here. In the middle, they don't know what's going on. <laughs> they're just completely baffled. And Celinda uh, hinted at that and stated to that. From, from my perspective, what I'm concerned about, if I go back and I think about Franklin, you know, I think about Jefferson, and I think about them saying, you, you have a republic if you can keep it. You know, we have we have increasing numbers of participation, even if the forms of participation are changing, we have more. We have people that are very interested, albeit distrusted, they distrust what they're participating in, but they don't know what's going on. And from an education standpoint, I'm really concerned about this because it's getting worse. I'll end with one uh, example. I have a student who came up to me the other day and he is an honor student. He's an honor student in the engineering college. And I know him because we worked hard to recruit him. He had a perfect ACT and he had a perfect SAT. This is a guy that's incredibly, incredibly bright. He went to one, I won't name it because I'm going to impugn it in a minute. He went to one of the better schools in Arkansas. And he came and he's sitting in the front row of, of my American national government class. And we start talking about the branches of government and we start talking about uh, checks and balances and these types of things. And he comes up to me afterwards and he's got this sheepy, shy look on his face and he says, you know, Dr. Shields, you know, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just shocked by all this. I'm like, you're shocked by the branches of government? Really? I mean, we got a long way to go here. And, you know, he said, well, you know, the only thing that I've ever seen, you know, he said, I had civics taught to me by our football coach. It was actually the assistant football coach. He would wheel in MTV, and then he would play MTV, and then we kind of got our civics education. Hmm. He said the only thing that we ever saw was when the president addressed the nation. Now, if you think about this, growing up, and this is his only experience, remember the president speaks, and the Supreme Court sits right down there, and the House and the Senate are together, and they stand up and clap, and they do this. In his mind, it's all together. That's how far we're com we've come that we are not teaching our kids about civics. We're not preparing them to participate in politics. And to me, that's a fundamental problem that we have long term and something that I would love to see reformed. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, listening to Todd, it made me um, think of one thing and you know we think of we see these comparisons of how often Americans vote in presidential elections versus people in other countries but I think one, one other thing to look at is I would make the argument that Americans vote more than any other people in the world <coughs> think about how often we are asked to vote over a four-year period of time we have presidential elections primaries we have midterm elections primaries in some states runoffs. We have uh, sometimes municipal elections are on a different date entirely. Special elections, bond issues, you know, five states have, odd, have all of their, their um, um, statewide elections are in odd numbered years, like, you know, Louisiana, Mississippi, New Jersey, Kentucky, Virginia, who did I miss? Virginia. Virginia. I mean, so if you think about it with primaries associated with those, and if you think about it, almost every time you turn around, 
there is an opportunity when you could vote. And I would, when you ask somebody from Europe, how often, if you voted in 100% of all elections, how many times over a four-year period of time would you be asked to vote? And generally, they'll tell you two. Probably one national election on average, and, and maybe one state, sort of the equivalent of statewide or provincial election. That's it. And, and, and I would argue that if we really wanted to get voter turnout up, we would consolidate some of these elections, and we would probably consolidate some of these offices. I mean, for example, my home state of Louisiana, um, Every, each of the 64 parishes elects a coroner. Now, coroner. A coroner. <laughs> yeah. That's a hell of a thing to run for. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and the thing about it is, what in the hell is that doing as an elected official? I mean, really. And um, in South Carolina, the head of the National Guard is a statewide elective post, the adjutant general. And you say, what? Ooh, you know, what's, what's, the, what's that all about? And, and the thing about it is, so, I mean, if you turn around, I mean, I think we kind of devalue the importance of voting by having so many elections when we probably ought to sort of consolidate some of them and then prune some of the offices so that, uh, which I realize is, is, is far easier said than done because every one of those offices has somebody that wants it and four other people that have, one, one person has it and four other people want it. So, but, 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 you know, I think if you think of it in that context, you know, we're not quite the electoral deadbeats that the world sort of makes us out to be. Next is turn to Nick Peniman, and um, you know, of, of all of Nick's credentials, to me, the, the one that I like the most is publisher of the, of the Washington Monthly. And, and, and you know, it's a publication that you know, those of us in Washington just love and cherished it. And it's, it's been, uh, you know, it's sort of been a, a ground, a place where just a lot of the best talent, uh, politi you know, journalistic talent in Washington, you know, started off at some point working for practically nothing at the Washington Monthly. But he's gone on to head up uh, United Republic. He was one of the top uh, investigative reporters for the Huffington Post uh, investigative unit and, um, and a real authority on the use of money and the influence of money in politics. So, Nick. Thank you. So unfortunately, when, when I was at the um, Washington Monthly, we were paying about um, 10 cents a word, which is, as any of the journalists in the audience know, is pretty cheap. And I, I fear that that's where the whole industry is going. The Monthly, as Charlie said, could survive based on that for decades, giving birth to James Fallows and Michael Kinsley and all these tremendous reporters because of the prestige factor. But now you really, it's hard to make a living as a journalist in America. Um, I was going to give a slightly different presentation, but I, I'm going to talk about something. Uh, I, I want to drill down, because Selena did such a fantastic job of explaining the polling around Washington dysfunctionality and money in politics. Um, I want to drill down on the, the problem with some facts and stats in Washington a little bit more, um, because I think, that, I think that too often, especially now, this whole problem of money in politics is seen as the creation of this Citizens United decision in January of 2010. When in fact, it's been a real problem for a long time. It began back in 1910, was actually the first campaign finance reform, which Teddy Roosevelt was able to ram through. It took him two years to get it through Congress. Um, but it was the, the initial ban on both corporate and union money into elections. And then there was 1947, and then there were post-Watergate reforms in 1974. And then there was some shoring up in 1976 of our campaign finance laws. And then, as you guys remember, 2002 was McCain-Feingold. But here's the image that emerges. If you, if you look at, in detail at each one of these reform fights, is that for about 100 years now, we've had an incredibly leaky roof over our democracy that's allowed the special interests and allowed big money to trickle money into the process for the sake of extracting specific favors and things that they want out of the system. And every 20 or 30 years, we, the American people, muster enough political energy to patch a certain hole in the roof. And unfortunately, right after we do that, another one emerges, and another one, another one. And I think that we're at a point now, and I, I do think that Citizens United helped, has helped crystallize this moment, in which we can't patch the roof anymore. Anyone who owns a home knows that there just reaches a point where the patch job isn't going to work where you're, you're actually, there's structural damage that's been done to the rafters, the ceilings are starting to show stains, 
And I think that we've got to, at this point, we've got to replace the roof. Stan Greenberg, who Celinda worked with earlier in her career, and was, of course, President Clinton's pollster and Tony Blair's pollster, uh, wrote this really stunning piece in the New York Times back in July. And it was about the fact that he's been studying, from a polling perspective, the electorate's opinion of money and politics and power in Washington for 30 years. And he concluded the piece saying, quote, I see clearly that voters feel ever more estranged from government. Everything they witness affirms the public's developing view of how government really works. They see a nexus of money and power greased by special interest lobbyists and large campaign contributions. They do not believe the fundamentals have really changed under Mr. Obama's Washington. About a couple weeks after that, Bill Moyers wrote a great op-ed in which he said, quote, all bets are off now. The great American experiment in creating different, a different future together has come down to the worship of individual cunning in the pursuit of wealth and power with both political parties cravenly subservient to big money. The result is in an economy that no longer serves ordinary men and women and their families. This, I believe, accounts for so much of the profound sense of betrayal in this country and for a tremendous sense of despair about the future. There's a great um, Thoreau quote in Walden in which he, he was talking about back in, in his day about the perceived apathy of the American public. And he said, um, he, he, he turned that notion of apathy on its head and he said that what is often considered to be, um, what did he call it, resignation. He said what is often considered to be resignation is actually confirmed desperation. And I think that that's what we're seeing in America today. I think we're seeing a sense of confirmed desperation about the fact that our government no longer seems capable of solving the fundamental problems that we collectively face as a society. They saw the sausage making of health care reform, which was not pretty. They saw the impotence of, of financial reform. Um, they, saw, they see government waste and abuse all over the place and two political parties that just can't seem to get anything done anymore, which is in sharp contrast to kind of the conversation that we saw last night with the former governors and the way Arkansas politics worked for 50 years. So, you know, the Tea Party has emerged because of it. Occupy has emerged because of it. Um, unfortunately, though, I think that, you're, that unless we can see a genuine right, left, and center movement emerge to, change, to, fix, to, to completely replace the roof, we're not going to get anywhere because Washington really is in a state of paralysis. And this was best expressed a while ago by this guy, Norm Ornstein, who some of you might know about. He's at the Conservative American Enterprise Institute. And, he's, and this is, you know, Washington is such a, a complicated town psychologically. Um, but, and Norm is one of the best psychologists in Washington, or the best at putting his finger on, on the way Washington thinks. And here's what he wrote in the wake of Citizens United about the way Washington works right now. He said, quote, ask almost any lobbyist. I hear the same story there over and over. The lobbyist met with a lawmaker to discuss a matter for a client, and before he gets back to the office, the cell phone rings and the lawmaker is already asking for money. The connections between policy actions or inactions and fundraising are no longer indirect or subtle. And he said, now comes another component. As one senator recently said to me, quote, we have all had experiences like the following. A lobbyist or interest representative will be in my office. He or she will say, you know, Americans for a better America really, really wants this amendment passed, and they have more money than God. I don't know what they will do with their money if they don't get what they want, but they're capable of spending a fortune, as you know, and it's enough to make anyone who crosses them regret it. So Ornstein now goes back and says, no money has to be spent to get the desired outcome. This is what Citizens United hath wrought. It is thoroughly corrupting. So my, my, we founded my organization, about, uh, launched about four months ago to create this left, right, and center coalition uh, to create a surge in the fight against big money. And I'd be happy to talk about that later. But when it comes down to the type of reforms that we're going to be pushing for, what Celinda said is right on, which is that people just want this problem fixed. And they actually trust reformers to come up with the solutions that fix it. The only thing they don't like is the idea of them funding elections in some way. But once you get beyond that hurdle, 
just about anything from transparency to clamping down on lobbyists to creating maybe a matching funds provision, you name it, they're all in, and this is probably the one issue uh, that, that has more popular support in this country than any other. So happy to take, take more questions about specifics. You know, listening to all these terrific well, presentations yeah. today, it sort of made me think of, you know, more aware, I mean, I knew of some of these resources that are out there, but not all of them, and didn't quite understand the full reach of some of these. But, you know, I think an awesome project for the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute might be to develop a, a, uh, an owner's manual for American citizens. Nice. How to find what? Nice. And, you know, category, money, uh, you know. Votes in Congress, uh, you know, you, you, you know, understand transparency in state government. I mean, and just sort of a guide that that all this is out there, and all these people, including a lot of the people that are in the room today, have spent you know millions of dollars and tens of thousands of hours of effort to develop these fabulous, fabulous resources, and yet if people, and particularly normal people, as opposed to those of us in this room. If Norman people aren't even aware that they exist, then, you know, anyway, I think something like that would be absolutely awesome. Let me kick off, and then we, because we want to go for, is that five minutes left in before the Q&A? Shoot. <laughs> I'm going to shut up. Let's open it up to the room. <laughs> Darn. Well, okay, while, while we're waiting for someone to come up, if you could, in terms of a practical, a practical solution, if you could wave a magic wand and get one or two reasonable, possible reforms done to make the system, and I'll, I'll, I'll go first, I would say redistricting reform, number one, and number two, open up primaries so that independents could uh, pick whichever side primary they want to vote in to kind of get expand the base and get more sort of moderates and independents uh, pr 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 um, participating in the process. Real quick, and then we'll go to this question right here. You know, I think that the first, I would love to be able to just get the public to understand that the president has very limited power. One of the things that I find most disillusioning is that every four years, everyone gets all excited that this new the newly elected president or, or give the incumbent another chance, they, they think that this person's gonna be able to solve the problem. After all, they campaign that way. They can solve everything, right? The reality is, is that they have a constitutional system that gives the president very limited power. And I would just love to start there and say, hey, let's, let's really make sure everybody even understands what constitutional authority does each branch have and the federal system, and your president's not going to be able to do it all. How about you, Nick? Well, obviously campaign finance, but I think we've got to go big. right? But how would you do that given the Supreme Court ruling? There, there, I've got, there are many different ways that you can actually get it through the Roberts Court, um, because there's a lot of stuff that you can do around lobbying and even campaign finance that will still pass the muster of the court. Uh, same day registration and public financing of campaigns. Okay. Okay, well, there was a, yeah, here Hi. we go. Yes, um, I think we can all kind of assume from, your, from the numbers that you showed us that without education, we cannot have true reform, and that's a key factor in all this. So um, and what Dr. Shields, the example that he gave of his student is that the emphasis of intelligence is, is gauged so commonly on math and science education. Uh, do you think that this is a long-term trend as a result of the Industrial Re Revolution, and do you think that in order to have facilitate political reform, we're going to have to have like a second enlightenment. Wow. Um, I do think it's a long-term trend. I mean, I think I would, in my mind, I'd go back to Kennedy and the race to the moon and emphasizing science and math and, and the NSF. And, and I would like to say, you know, I support science and math education. And I, I know that as a country, we're behind in that. And so I want just to do better with science and math education. I just don't want to do it at the expense of being able to, to write legibly and know how our system really works. But fundamentally, our, our younger generations come into a uh, will here is the major exception, by the way. I just talked to him about lunch, and he knows more about it than any of us up here. But um, they come into the political uh, process very much a blank slate. And if it's not on... Uh, the nightly show or something that you know is a comedy as well. They really don't have a clue what's going on. 
and I would toss in economics. Next yeah, question. Oh, those don't even go there. Economics, they don't even know that they're going to go in debt if they take a credit card. Dan Farader can tell you when we do first year experience, we come in and we say, hey, wait a minute, students, you really understand. The more you spend on that, the more you spiral into debt. And for many of them, it's a light bulb. There's no, there's no personal finance education in schools today. That's really true. Hi, my name is Lee Gordon. Nick, you described the, the case that maybe Americans uh, don't want to continue to repair the roof. If indeed that's the case, could you or any one of the four of you up there describe maybe what kind of a roof they are looking for when they replace it? Ooh. Yeah, so um, part, I think part of this is, is so there's, the, there's the, the court stands in the way of some reforms, but, but I'll give you a really quick list, okay? Ending lobbyist graft. So not allowing politicians to actually accept contributions from lobbyists would be huge. The, the point is, and this could pass legal muster, I've, I've run this by some of the best lawyers in Washington. The point is that the moment you register as a lobbyist, it's clear that you've got business to do with the government. And when you start spending money on politicians, it makes it, it creates a suspect relationship which creates the appearance of corruption, right? Which is regulatable even under the Roberts Court. Um, Lobbyists who don't register as lobbyists. Tom Daschle is a lobbyist. He doesn't register as one. Newt Gingrich, remember he had to say that he was an historian for Freddie Mac. He wasn't an historian for Freddie Mac. He was is a lobbyist. Is this a great country to make Mac. a, exactly. is paying historians like that or right. what? Exactly. <laughs> so expand the definition of lobbying. In the revolving door, right now 50% of members of Congress go directly from Capitol Hill to K Street and about 65% of their staff do. You've got to, we've got to end the fact that politicians are going to now see public service as a pathway to private gain, as a pathway to cashing out. The endless fundraising that politicians do. The, the New York City has a really fascinating model. They have a, a matching funds model that matches one to six, any contribution up to 175 bucks. So if I give a pop politician 50 bucks, the politician actually gets 300 bucks. So it, what's, what's happened in New York City is it's driven the fundraising down to the small donor level and away from the millionaire thousand dollar plate fundraisers. So that's, that's, an, that's a really sensible one that we could ram through too that again passes muster. Super PACs, there's a coordination problem with super PACs, I won't get too wonky, but if you actually redefine what coordination means, you'd probably kill most of the candidate specific super PACs overnight. Um, lack of enforcement, the FEC is completely lame. The uh, Public Integrity Division at Department of Justice is totally underfunded and not looking into bribery cases that they should be looking into. So those are just some ideas. But, but, but I think that we've got, my sense is, is that having studied this as a journalist for 10 years, we got to go big here. We can't just say we want a watered down disclose act here and then we'll go for another piece of something here. We got we to gotta come up with something big and bold and imaginative that the American people can get behind and fight for. You know, in an era when political discourse is usually defined as a, it, it constitutes a food fight that we see on cable television, you know, yesterday afternoon and all day today, not so much last night, but that uh, uh, we've just had an amazing, amazing rational discussion, not without being disagreeable. And I just think this, uh, this symposium has just been uh, a terrific, terrific discussion of a lot of important things facing our country and honoring uh, a great man who, uh, who really kicked off a succession of, of terrific governors of the state from both parties. So um, thank you, what thank you. great panelists, thank and you. thank all of you for, for putting this on. And Christy, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.